Are you ready then? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, so look, uh, I'm just going to show you a series of things here. This, this, is a, uh, this is a picture by Bonnard. Uh, the life in the picture doesn't come from the fact that the sunset was, had life. It is in the picture. I mean, in other words, it comes from the yellow, the purple, the pale yellow, the green, that are, and exactly the way these are organized. This makes this thing, this actual piece of cardboard, alive. This is an axe that has that in it. Um, I mean, it's in everything. It's in the heft of the handle. It's in the way the head is made. It's in the fact that you can drive nails with it as well as chalk wood, pull nails. It's everything in that thing. And it's also in this shape. This is a piece of the Alhambra. I don't know what wall this came off and how big it was, but it certainly must have been as long as this room here. Each individual piece was taken with the same amount of love and care so that the life was brought into this one green hexagon on the same level that the person had it in mind to bring life to the whole thing. Um, and, and, and that's really... That's the key of what is going on in any of these things. There is no part of it that doesn't have that sort of uh, in deep infusion of life into it. Uh, of course, that's a different process completely from the one that's normally used to make a building today, and that's where the whole problem arises, because it's very difficult to do that under the circumstances where it's not assumed that that's what the point is. When you recognize that that is the point, and then you have to find ways of doing that in our time, then life gets interesting. <laughs> 30 miles east of San Francisco, Alexander and his associates have established the Center for Environmental Structure. Are you able to do what I'm asking? In other words, is that technically possible? Their goal is to develop a new approach to architecture, where feeling comes first, and process is paramount. If you think about a typical development that would be done today, the place where it starts is with a drawing. And we've assumed that if it's a good drawing, then the thing is going to be OK. That's simply a mistake. Life cannot be produced from a drawing. Life can only be produced from a process. This approach incorporates the design of buildings into every step of their construction. Not surprisingly, it conflicts with standard architectural practices. We're architects and contractors, build buildings. I think on that level of description, it's completely ordinary. I suppose the part that isn't is that we're trying to do something that no one else has ever tried to do in the 20th century. Could you verbalize what that thing is? Well, make God appear in the middle of a field. On a site surrounded by tea bushes near Tokyo stands Alexander's largest project to date. The new Asian campus is a combined high school and college designed with the full participation of the teachers and students. It marries state-of-the-art design techniques with age-old building methods. Alexander wanted the buildings to evolve naturally out of the site. He was seeking to create an outer environment that would permit an inner feeling of freedom and peacefulness. The campus started as the dream of a Japanese high school principal named Hisei Hosoi. 
For over a year, Hosoi searched his country for an architect willing to work closely with the teachers and students. He wanted to create the ideal place in which to learn. But he could not find a Japanese architect who shared his vision. I got lost in the forest. It may be called the forest of modern architecture. In a Tokyo bookstore, Hosoi came across the Oregon Experiment, which described how a university community collectively planned its new campus. The book's chief author was Christopher Alexander. When I read it, I felt I met the architect whom I have been looking for for long. In a rundown neighborhood near downtown San Jose, a unique project is nearing completion. This particular project was important because it's the first and that we know of the only shelter that was designed and built new for the homeless mentally ill. On the hotel in Martinez. Mm -hmm. Alda Ludovico heads Housing for Independent People, a nonprofit agency committed to finding housing solutions for the disabled and the homeless. Probably uh, there's nothing more terrifying than not having a place to sleep. It's uh, one thing to talk about it and think about it intellectually, but emotionally when, you, when it gets to be dark and, and it's getting cold and you look around for a spot to sleep and the only place you got to sleep is the street. Or a bush. Uh, uh, that's terrifying. Okay, next. What's your bed number? Uh, yeah, Robert Jeremy's money. What's your bed number? E sixty seven. To design his shelter, De Ludovico looked for an architect interested in creating an environment that could make the homeless feel at home. I see. Oh well that'll be fine. That sounds nice. We had interviewed a number of architects, and we were struck with Chris's passion for the homeless, basically. He talked about space being a part of the healing process. I think it's why we were interested in the idea that if a homeless person came in here and was really disordered and was having struggle getting himself or herself together, that if, in fact, that happens, you can sit down at a bench and make a connection with your environment that it could be the uh, trigger to uh, changing your life. I love them. Right. My dad used to grow them. Yeah? Yeah. Here you go. Hi. How you doing? I sold out again today. I had one Polish left, and it came in bought We have a good dorm. You know, all in our dorm upstairs, we have a good time every night. We, we share you know, what we've been through, mostly pray and um, read the Bible. Thy kingdom come, thy will, will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Our daily bread. In designing the shelter, Christopher Alexander was seeking to express a vital but elusive quality he calls wholeness. The crux of the issue is wholeness is a real thing. And if you mention a concept like wholeness, or you talk about harmony, or uh, the life of a thing, it may happen somebody will get a sort of glazed look in their eye, or they'll start saying, oh, you know, what, what's that? Or assume that it's a matter of opinion or a matter of private taste. The place where I start, and where this whole subject has to start, is that that thing, that wholeness, the harmony which occurs, is a real palpable thing which we can understand, discover, it affects our feelings. Above all, it, it's real. For thousands of years, the architecture that was made in traditional society 
was essentially connected with our feeling, my feeling, your feeling. What was built arose out of that feeling and was intended to strengthen a person in their feeling. These places in history that one admires now, which have a sort of incredible roundness and comfort, whether it's at the sort of extreme high end, like some great palace or great cathedral, or whether it's at the extreme low end, like some, um, it could be a little shack or something, they all share a lack of their own self-importance uh, because they're concentrating on what life is, not what they are, so to speak. For 60 or 70 years, that just has not been here in our conceptions of building or architecture or our conceptions of cities. By now, actually, it's been accepted that the monetary ambitions of the developer, that is all right to be the main governing factor determining how cities are built. I mean, it's quite an incredible state of affairs if you think about it. We're down here to look at a normal part of a central city, and uh, I think you should uh, just kind of... <laughs> look at that thing. Um, this is... This is sort of the cheap shot stuff. I mean, there's lots of that and that and that and that around, um, which is very, very big, very undifferentiated, very alienating. Uh, I think most people know that there's something wrong with it and don't really like it. The hard part is to understand that also this kind of joke here is got something seriously wrong with it. This is a postmodern architect's answer to that problem. The difficulty is that the whole thing is still imprisoned in the idea of images and surface things which are utterly insincere and in a way make you feel like death almost more than that thing does. So here we are in this uh, kind of cute pseudo 19th century street uh, done in this postmodern fashion and the main I mean, if you look at it very, very carefully, you need to come and get the camera to look at it very intensely. I mean, even the people sitting there, somehow, life is not quite real over there. And you say, well, why is that happening? Is that an illusion or is that real? To try to understand how, how it works and why it's going on, if you look at this wall, for instance, contrast it with the wall that we looked at yesterday. You know, the wall yesterday was actually much more roughly made than this, but it was also a concrete wall of not very different dimension. But it was completely human, because you could be on it, children could be running on it, you could be next to it, all of that kind of stuff. This one happens to be made so that you don't want to be next to it, you can't be on it. A child wouldn't go on it, because they couldn't climb up on it, the kind of aged child that would want to go on it. So er everything about it, you can do nothing. All that happens is that a sort of dead zone is created from here out to about here. And basically, this thing is surrounded with a huge dead zone. And so the reason that people over there look as though they're in Alphaville is because every part of the environment, every tile, every grill, every window, every tile hung on that building is all doing that stuff. If you look at that central bay window, for example, the big uh, black bay window there, you contrast it, let's say, with one of the windows in San Jose, which are no great shakes. When you look at one of those windows down there, again, you feel yourself in that window, because the window was chosen in order to produce that and to have that feeling in it. That one is intentionally chosen so as not to have it. It isn't just an accident that it doesn't have it. The point is that the architects who are working at the moment are so embarrassed by all of this, along with everybody else, that in order to show that they're good architects, they've actually got to make it so that it alienates you. And that's what's up there. It's that absolute intent to destroy emotion. Throughout his career, Christopher Alexander has been developing a new approach to architecture. It is based on the idea that buildings should be shaped by the ways that people live. A pattern language invites readers to become involved in designing their own environments. The book explores the patterns of people's daily interaction with places.
and it proposes solutions to common architectural problems, from the planning of a region to the placement of a window. In Japan, the pattern language of the new school evolved from intensive discussions. The teachers told Alexander their dreams for the campus, a body of water, stone foundation walls, Rooms warm and feeling, with gallery spaces to one side. Now it was time to create the site plan. Amid the tea bushes, the blueprint for the new school took shape. Each building was laid out with bamboo stakes on the land itself not on a piece of paper, as is usually done. Although nothing was built yet, this process made the campus appear before Hosoi's eyes. It may seem a little strange, but actually we could see the invisible buildings there we could imagine the feeling of the campus. Hosoi and Alexander had imagined an all-wood gymnasium as a central part of the new campus. But the big Japanese construction company building the school resisted arguing for conventional steel technology. At the core of this conflict was a clash between radically different approaches to building. While one approach is driven by money and technological efficiency, Alexander's method has a different goal. Obviously, people will talk about trying to do a good job, and they are trying to do a good job in some terms of reference, no doubt. But it just isn't governed by an all-consuming desire to produce wholeness at every moment. It's funny, you know, this thing, although it looks better when you're looking at it like this, you hold it up there, it looks pretty weird up there. Whereas this one, in the Middle Ages, that was going on, of course, it was thought of as being in relation to God, and so that people who worked on the big buildings, every, every moment what they were doing was considered as a gift to God. So in that sense, then, they felt obliged to try and do the best possible for the life of the whole at each moment. That was the governing motive, and that affected exactly the sort of minute details of what they did. Now the minute details of what are done are controlled by other main motives. And that's where the origin of the whole difficulty is. Hey, Al. How's it going? Good, good, thanks. It very quickly can break out into all kinds of violent arguments. It's almost like it needs about half that quantity. Very, very major disputes about almost anything about organization, time, money who controls what, which, what is done first and what is done second. When you start rearranging things, uh, I hadn't expected that it would be so upsetting, but it is, practically speaking, upsetting every inch of the way. The same red as that. When it got time to build the, uh, uh, put the trusses in the dining room, which are going to hold up the roof, uh, the contractor didn't know what the trusses looked like. So on one hand, we're saying to the contractor, get the damn trusses up so we can put the roof on. Uh, he's saying, I don't know what to do with, because we don't have any drawings that, uh, that tell us what to do here. The trusses began to be, for some reason, important. I mean, it was, it, it was more just out of a sake of a kind of pleasure. You know, he just wanted to make something beautiful. 
um, started thinking about what the trusses might be like. The idea that Gary and I had had for some time was essentially building a truss like a piece of Belgian lace, which would be structurally sound, which would contain all kinds of curved members, and which could be made because of the plastic nature of concrete. The trusses were going to be concrete. We thought that was a good idea. It turned out to be experimental in their design. That experiment took forever to work out. It actually had to get worked out on the ground. I knew the trusses were one of the most important things that we'd ever made, and I had to practically hit everybody on the head including my dearest and most beloved associates to actually do this because everybody wanted out and I mean the amount of effort was just simply beyond what you can imagine. This building went up uh, during one of the bitterest winters we've had in San Jose. We had people out on the street we wanted to get in there. A very, so, so we had to, we began thinking, wait a minute, uh, we like the idea of the building. We like the idea of healing. If it isn't done and people are out on the street freezing, what the hell good is it? Of course, I must have asked myself a thousand times, you know, am I, am I leading to disaster here? Am I I'm doing something foolhardy? Uh, you know, is it right that I'm taking all these people into this situation and forcing them, really? We're a relatively small agency. Um, to have overruns this size is, uh, th threatens the agency. Uh, uh, our, our reputation for building uh, projects within budget has uh, uh, basically been destroyed on this project. Nobody will ever believe us again. Um, uh, so, so for us, the emotion went through real frustration, uh, uh, feeling like uh, we made a mistake, that it would have been better to simply build a box because at least people would have shelter. Nobody knew how to build these things except us. I don't quite why I went to such extreme lengths to make sure that we could actually do this. I had some kind of determination to do it, almost no matter what was involved, I don't know. Uh, You know, you never know. I mean, you can go to a lot of trouble with a thing like that, and actually what you get is sort of, okay. In this particular case, uh, something happened in here of tremendous force, I think. So it's a serious matter, a very serious matter emotionally in here. In Japan, the controversy over the gymnasium was finally resolved when the construction company agreed to build what the architect and the high school principal wanted. This work, supervised by an elderly master craftsman, is the largest wooden structure built in Japan since World War II. As the final work on the school's construction was completed, Hosoi wrote Alexander a letter. Dear Chris, I am looking forward to sharing an indescribable pleasure about our success in this project. It's confirmed by the actual result. After experiencing many painful and serious situations, we've got over together. And spring has come. Please let me say to you again, 
we've succeeded at last. Very sincerely yours, Hosoi. It's just a question of whether you can, in a way, hand somebody a present, and that because of that little thing, they start to feel their own humanity, and they feel more connected to everything. I feel that I'm so far from you, Lord. But still I hear you calling me. Those simple things that I, I love you. I love you. Okay. 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 So renew my faith, Lord, restore my joy. And I need you to dry, dry my weeping eyes. And it's so, Lord, take me back. Oh, Lord, take me back. Take me back to the place where I first. Take me back to the place where I, where I first believed. Find ways of doing that in our time, then life gets interesting. Thirty miles east of San Francisco, Alexander and his associates have established the Center for Environmental Structure. Are you able to do what I'm asking? In other words, is that technically possible? Their goal is to develop a new approach to architecture, where feeling comes first and process is paramount. If you think about a typical development that would be done today, the place where it starts is with a drawing. And we've assumed that if it's a good drawing, then the thing is going to be okay. That's simply a mistake. Life cannot be produced from a drawing. Life can only be produced from a process. This approach incorporates the design of buildings. In Are you ready then? Oh, okay. Okay, so look, uh, I'm just going to show you a series of things here. This, this, is a, um, this is a picture by Bonnar. Uh, the life in the picture doesn't come from the fact that the sunset was, had life. It is in the picture. I mean, in other words, it comes from the yellow, the purple, the pale yellow, the green, that are, and exactly the way these are organized this makes this thing, this actual piece of cardboard, alive. This is an axe that has that in it. Um, I mean, it's in everything. It's in the heft of the handle. It's in the way the head is made. It's in the fact that you can drive nails with it as well as chalk wood nails it's everything in that thing and it's also in this shape this is a piece of the art to every step of their construction not surprisingly it conflicts with standard architectural practices we're architects and contractors build buildings I think on that level of description is completely ordinary I suppose the part that isn't is that we're trying to do something that no one else has ever tried to do in the 20th century could you verbalize what that thing is? Well, make God appear in the middle of a field.
On a site surrounded by tea bushes near Tokyo stands Alexander's largest project to date. The new Asian campus is a combined high school and college, designed with the full participation of the teachers and students. Remember, I don't know what wall this came off and how big it was, but it certainly must have been as long as this room here. Each individual piece was taken with the same amount of love and care so that the life was brought into this one green hexagon on the same level that the person had it in mind to bring life to the whole thing. Um, and, and, and that's really, that's the key of what is going on in any of these things. There is no part of it that doesn't have that sort of uh, in deep infusion of life into it. Uh, of course, that's a different process completely from the one that's normally used to make a building today, and that's where the whole problem arises, because it's very difficult to do that under the circumstances where it's not assumed that that's what the point is. When you recognize that that is the point, and then you have to... It marries state-of-the-art design techniques with age-old building methods. Alexander wanted the buildings to evolve naturally out of the site. He was seeking to create an outer environment that would permit an inner feeling of freedom and peacefulness. The campus started as the dream of a Japanese high school principal named Hisei Hosoi. For over a year, Hosoi searched his country for an architect willing to work closely with the teachers and students. He wanted to create the ideal place in which to learn. But he could not find a Japanese architect who shared his vision. I got lost in the forest. It may be called the forest.